Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for the second lecture in the Yu Ying Shi Lecture in History 2016 series. Yu Ying Shi Lecture in History is co hosted annually by Chung Chi College and New Asia College of the Chinese University of Hong Kong and co organized by the Department of History since 2007. This year, we're very honored to have Professor Hoy Cleveland Tolman from Arizona State University as our speaker of the day. Professor Chen Hu Yu will be our moderator of the day. Today's lecture will be on conflicts between filial piety and loyalty in Chinese culture history. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Hong Kong Museum of History, who has provided us with a decent venue and for their efforts in promoting this lecture series. The lecture is about to officially begin. May we please invite our speaker, Professor Hoi Tolman, and moderator, Professor Zheng Hu Yu, on stage, please. So um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you first for the MC's uh, really brilliant introduction for this lecture, and uh, personally, I have to say I am so glad to be the moderator of this lecture as uh, uh, some of my colleagues may know. Professor Tillman is my supervisor in the Arizona State University. Uh, let me uh, remind us a story uh, which happened 40 years ago, in 1976, I guess, if I make it wrong, please correct me. Professor Tillman was graduated from the Harvard University, and at that time, his supervisor, one of his supervisors, I guess it's Professor Yu Ying Shi, uh, which 40 years later, um, Professor Tillman is sitting here and holding a lecture for us in honor of Professor Yu Ying Shi's series of lecture. And I think it's a kind of a destiny or fate. In Chinese, we call it like a yuan fen. So um, I think that's a pretty awesome uh, scenario which happened here today, here. Uh, and uh, I have to say something about Professor Tillman's um, um, academic achievement. Um, maybe some of us may, may not be quite familiar with Professor Tillman's um, academic achievement, but I think Professor Tillman is one of the leading intellectual historians in um, Chinese social, intellectual, and cultural history around the world. And, uh, um, and I guess for his most famous celebrated publications, uh, among a lot of publications, of course, if I have to say to read them or I need to have two more hours. But I will only say two books. One is uh, Utilitarian Confucianism. And the other is um, uh, Zhu Xi's Ascendancy, a uh, Confucian Discourse and Zhu Xi's Ascendancy. And both uh, monographs, we got Chinese translations for both books. Uh, the second one, Zhu Xi the Si Wei Shi Jie. I think um, many friends sitting here may have a chance to, 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 to read this book before. So um, I think Professor Tillman is now uh, doing something quite different from his early studies and turned to um, uh, modern or even contemporary conceptions of Chinese culture. Um, so let's uh, welcome Professor Tillman once again and his following speech. Professor Tillman. <clears throat> Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, I appreciate especially uh, the uh, opportunity to be introduced by uh, my favorite uh, former graduate student. And I'm especially uh, uh, humbled and honored to be able to participate in this uh, uh, lecture series honoring uh, uh, my mentor, uh, you ensure. And for this, uh, these two lectures, uh, what I'm uh, attempting to do is uh, share with you uh, some of the uh, themes, uh, two of the themes that I developed in my Zhongguo uh, Tongshu General Survey of Chinese History uh, course uh, in a way to honor uh, Professor Yu and the first course in Chinese history that I took with him in the fall of uh, 1969. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in turning to the lecture uh, today, um, what I'm uh, seeking to do is uh, 
use some literature as uh, Professor Yu has done, particularly with the Hong Lo Meng, uh, to discuss uh, Chinese intellectual and cultural developments. Uh, that's, of course, a much more uh, sophisticated uh, a piece of literature uh, with real psychological depth uh, to it uh, compared to my particular favorite uh, novel, which is the uh, uh, Sanguo Yen Yi. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, Zhengji University and, uh, and uh, College and New Asia College uh, and the Department of uh, History at uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong for this uh, amazing opportunity to return to Hong Kong and to uh, join with you in honoring uh, Professor Yu's contributions to Chinese history and culture. <clears throat> First, uh, a little bit of uh, background. Uh, the central sort of uh, theme here, uh, tension between uh, loyalty and filial piety in Chinese history, <clears throat> um, is a, an assignment that I give to the undergraduates in America in this course uh, when I teach it. <clears throat> and I have them uh, read an English translation uh, of the uh, Sanguini, uh using Moss Roberts' uh, a translation uh, published by uh, UC Berkeley Press. And I do this uh, because a lot of uh, the American students sort of assume that uh, Chinese values uh, being traditional basically didn't change until the 20th century. And um, I use this assignment to help them understand that Chinese values have uh, changed uh, through the centuries and not simply uh, within the last uh, 100 years. And um, the primary uh, inspiration or center of the talk for today will be uh, a line out of the uh, Sanguini uh, when uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Xu Xu or Shanfu, and I think I'll prefer to call him Shanfu, one of Liu Bei's uh, uh, chief ad early advisors, uh, when his mother uh, tells him uh, that there is conflict between filial piety and loyalty, therefore one has to choose one's priorities very uh, carefully. Um, <clears throat> and uh, to set the stage for this uh, uh, conflict, I want to start with the Analects and then go on. Uh, we'll, uh, maybe we'll s sort of go d uh, down. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, starting with the uh, with the Analects, and I'll uh, project these. Uh, passages on the screen so uh, you can uh, see the, uh, the Chinese text. Uh, most of them won't have the English uh, translation. But one of the fascinations I have with dealing with Chinese uh, intellectual history, Chinese thought, is analyzing or looking at uh, how uh, Chinese sort of wrestle with problems. And in contrast with the West, where the fundamental question is all the way back to the Greeks, is what is truth? What is beauty? What is justice, etc.? And that type of uh, question has certain uh, advantages. Uh, but to me, uh, the tradition of Western-style definition in Chinese culture is relatively neglected, I think primarily because in traditional China, 
these questions were relatively simple and straightforward. Um, and what was more uh, compelling, I think, in Chinese traditional culture is the issue of what do you do when two values that you believe in and seek to uphold, what do you do when those values conflict with one another? Um, and to me, this is a much more sophisticated uh, and interesting question uh, than the simple uh, what is truth, what is beauty, et cetera. Uh, so I want to uh, explore that. Um, but to give a, a background for uh, the tradition, we'll start with Confucius and Mencius as a backdrop so that by the time we get to the Sangguo Yan Yi at the end, uh, we can get a clear sense of just how much uh, Chinese culture has uh, changed. And in, in the Lun Yu, uh, Confucius is confronted by this official in uh, the south in a small state who tells him that in his area, the people are really law-abiding because uh, when and if a father steals a sheep, the son will report to the authorities so that the father can be appropriately punished. And uh, Confucius replies that those that are upright or true, uh, doing uh, what's proper, are different from uh, his area, of course, in Shandong. Um, fathers cover for sons, and sons cover for, for fathers, and being upright lies in this. And uh, this is a way of emphasizing uh, Confucius's view that what's most crucial to a society isn't its laws, but the warm bonds of relationship that hold family and society together. And that uh, these type of bonds are far more important uh, than simply uh, laws and uh, ordinary uh, customs. Uh, and of course, uh, Chinese over the centuries have sought to mitigate or lessen uh, the uh, contrast to the tension here. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Zhu Xi uh, interpreted uh, the word uh, uh, wrong, uh, uh, wrong yang, to, uh, with the idea that here the person was stealing the sheep because the family needed this food uh, to survive. So there was a, uh, a circumstance to sort of justify uh, the father stealing uh, the, the sheep. But it's interesting that uh, Confucius doesn't focus on that, uh, but makes a more uh, general uh, statement. Um, now we want to uh, turn to some of Mencius's uh, uh, statements. And the best uh, sort of test case with Mencius is Xun, uh, because Xun was uh, famous for his filial piety toward his parents, even though, of course, uh, his parents uh, tried a couple of times uh, to kill him. Um, but uh, <clears throat> um, someone uh, came to Mencius and asked him uh, the question, uh, what if uh, Shun's uh, father were to commit murder, kill someone? Uh, what would happen? And Mencius uh, embraces his hypothetical question, uh, which most uh, leaders in modern society would veer away from, too dangerous to answer this type of question. 
uh, but Mencius doesn't flinch. Uh, he said, well, uh, the only thing to do was to apprehend uh, Shun's father. The questioner, in some disbelief, says, would Shun really allow that? And Mencius' response is, well, uh, the head of the uh, Justice Department here, uh, Gao Yao, that's his job. So even the ruler uh, could not intervene and order uh, the justice minister not to apprehend uh, the father. Uh, still, the questioner pushes Mencius, and Mencius responds, essentially, if this happened, Shun would forsake his throne, he would take his father piggyback, flee to a remote corner of the world, and simply take care of his father and forget about his uh, empire. So uh, this is a very uh, stark example how even to the ruler, uh, filial piety should be more important than law, even for the ruler. So this is an escalation uh, here uh, in uh, the Confucian uh, case. Uh, the, uh, the next is simply a, a quotation to show uh, why Mencius regards Shun as such an appropriate model, that he didn't simply uh, understand or have keen insight into human relationships. Um, he uh, uh, followed uh, the path of what was right, uh, morality. He didn't just put morality into practice. In other words, he really uh, lived it. Next. And um, this next uh, slide uh, goes into more detail here and uh, explains better uh, why uh, Confucius and Mencius would regard uh, Shun's response as better for society than merely laws and punishments. And uh, here, again, the emphasis focuses on Shun's father and Shun's effort to please his father, even though his father is totally unworthy of this type of respect. And Mencius makes the point here in this passage that when Shun was able to please his father and his father able to respond to Shun's uh, ethics and Shun's filial piety, this transformed uh, the father so that when uh, people saw the transformation of this rather evil father, they could see just how Shun was a model for not only filial piety, uh, but for transforming society uh, through uh, this uh, family uh, virtue. Uh, next, we want to uh, move ahead uh, to the uh, Xiaojing, uh, the classic of filial piety, as a new translation uh, out by uh, Rosemont and Ames. I think Ames has given the Chen Mu lecture uh, here in the past. Um, uh, the uh, classic of family uh, rel uh, reverence. Um, we'll move forward. Um, according to the text itself, uh, Confucius is expounding on filial piety to his student at uh, Zongzi. Uh, and traditionally, Chinese have accepted this at face value. Uh, but uh, if we look more closely, modern scholars, uh, for example, point out that the first text that quotes the Xiaoqing was written 
in 239 uh, BC. Uh, so modern scholars uh, tend to think that this text is probably very, very late uh, Warring States or early uh, Western Han uh, in time period. Uh, and it doesn't become a classic uh, until uh, the Tang period with Tang uh, Xuanzong, who uh, combines the new text and old text uh, versions and uh, has the text of the Xiaojing uh, carved on a stele uh, in uh, the capital in uh, Xi'an. So this is uh, the first time it's given full recognition as a, a classic. And uh, the uh, early Northern Song uh, scholar, uh, 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 Xing Bing, uh, writes a, uh, a commentary uh, to uh, this edition of the uh, Shaojing and emphasizes uh, that the ruler uh, uses uh, the Shaojing not only uh, to rule, but first and foremost to cultivate himself as a ruler and to become a better uh, person. Uh, so the, uh, the, the Wangzhi becomes uh, Wang Zhao, or so the teachings of the, of the ruler. Um, and uh, what I want to sort of uh, uh, look at uh, 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 here are a few of these uh, 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 passages. Um, and uh, how these uh, passages uh, sort of reflect some of the ideas in the um, in the in the text, I think maybe we skipped one or something. Um, um, um. Oh, here we go. Um, and in this uh, uh, first passage. Uh, we have uh, a proclamation about the effectiveness of uh, filial piety uh, for transforming uh, people uh, through teachings and to teach them how to have love and affection uh, for one another. And that uh, the Xiaojing, through uh, filial piety and through teachings of how to deal with one's elders uh, provides the sort of foundation for uh, uh, ruling um, and bringing proper order uh, to, the, to the people. Um, maybe the next one. Um, and uh, here, uh, uh, again, is uh, uh, maybe go to the next one. Okay. Um, uh, w with this one, uh, you have a discussion about the importance of doing more uh, than simply uh, following one's father's uh, commands that uh, uh, filial piety means much more uh, than that uh, because you need to uh, not only love your parents uh, but be able to remonstrate uh, with your uh, parents uh, just as you remonstrate uh, with uh, your ruler. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, passage, uh, you get, uh, again, this emphasis here in, in human conduct. There's nothing more important 
than family uh, reverence. In family reverence, there's nothing more important than venerating one's father. In venerating one's father, there's nothing more important than placing him on a par with heaven. And the Duke of Zhou was able to uh, do this. Um, so here's a significant sort of elevation of uh, the father uh, to making a connection uh, directly uh, with uh, heaven. In uh, the uh, next uh, uh, passage uh, here, uh, we have uh, a, a further sort of emphasis on the duty to father as having uh, priority uh, because it is uh, more primary and complete uh, than others. Lower officials uh, drawing upon their devotion to their fathers to serve their mothers, the love they feel toward them is the same. Drawing upon their devotion to their fathers to serve their ruler, the respect that they feel is the same. While to their mother, love is rendered and to their ruler, respect is shown. It is only in the service to their fathers that both love and respect combine. Hence, service to the Lord, a ruler, with family reverence, is loyalty. Service to elders, with family reverence, is compliance. Uh, thus, the Xiaoqing is distinguishing uh, filial piety and loyalty to rulers, but presenting loyalty to rulers as an extension of the more basic uh, virtue of filial piety. In short, in the classic of filial piety, although duties to fathers and rulers are uh, emphasized, one's relationship to these superiors is projected as reciprocal. And a human response to the gratitude and care and concern uh, that parents and the ruler has first extended uh, to them. Uh, but the filial pi piety to parents is the root or, national, or natural origin of virtue with both respect and love. Uh, moreover, the aspect of respect should be shown uh, good rulers in the form of uh, the care uh, that they have uh, uh, given. Um, um, uh, yes. In, in this uh, uh, passage, there's an emphasis here that obedience uh, to uh, uh, superiors uh, have uh, limits, and the limits are what is appropriate. In this passage, exemplary persons or gentlemen while serving those above at court, reflect on how they can give their utmost loyalty to them, and on retiring, reflect on how to resolve the excesses of their superiors. They're fully compliant in carrying out what is commendable in the instructions of those above, and take steps to remedy what cannot be condoned. Um, the uh, you know, what is uh, what is wrong or even evil. So there's a, uh, an injunction here or a command that one is supposed to uh, counter what is inappropriate or even uh, evil in uh, one's uh, superiors. So the view within the uh, classic of Filial piety, although 
there is more accommodation with the state and with the ruler than we saw in Confucius and Mencius, uh, but the loyalty one and duty that one has toward uh, parents and the ruler is not absolute, is not unconditional. As uh, Shunzi had said earlier, when you are faced with a choice between uh, following the orders of the ruler or following the Tao, the way, your obligation is to follow uh, the Tao. Um, now I want to uh, turn uh, to another uh, uh, text and sort of focus on the early imperial period and look especially at the uh, Chuncho uh, Fan Lu, um, uh, early uh, Tang, uh, uh, Han uh, text, which is uh, traditionally ascribed to the next uh, gentleman here, uh, uh, Dong Zhong Xu. Uh, uh, Dong was a, an advisor to Han Wu Di, um, and uh, Han Wu Di uh, uh, pardoned him uh, when he was convicted of uh, uh, making complaints, or writing complaints about the uh, uh, two fires that uh, uh, burned uh, the ancestral uh, temple of Emperor uh, uh, Gaozu, and uh, he was charged by the state and convicted of using uh, these omens uh, to criticize uh, the, the government, uh, but the emperor uh, pardoned him, and probably uh, pardoned him in large part because uh, of his uh, views uh, that were very supportive of the unique uh, power of the, uh, of the emperor. And uh, we talked uh, uh, on, on campus a few days ago about uh, one of uh, uh, Dong Zhong Xu's uh, uh, famous sayings about the co uh, cosmic role of the, of the ruler. And uh, I want uh, today to sort of look at uh, some of the specific things in this uh, uh, in this uh, Chuncho Fan Lu, although a lot of the text is later writings in the Han try to focus primarily on uh, chapters that are closely identified with uh, Dong Zhong Shu himself. And uh, one of these, um, uh, chapter 71, um, about the importance of the suburban sacrifice uh, to, to heaven. Uh, Tung Zhong Shu emphasized this, that this was the obligation of the emperor as the son of heaven, the Tianzi, and argued that these sacrifices uh, to heaven should mark the beginning of the imperial ritual cycle and the beginning of the uh, calendar um, and tried to convince uh, Hamudi to make this the primary uh, ritual. Hamudi was not very receptive uh, to that uh, view. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the next uh, couple of uh, chapters here were written by Tung Zhong Xu's uh, students uh, to try to convince uh, Han emperors that the sacrifices to heaven had priority even over mourning rituals for imperial ancestors and sacrifices uh, to deceased uh, emperors. Um, but it was 
the Han emperors were very slow to embrace uh, Tong Zhongshu's uh, policy, and it really wasn't until the usurper Wang Meng uh, that these sacrifices to heaven were uh, at the very center of the ritual uh, calendar and the whole uh, ritual sequence. Uh, Tong Zhongshu's own uh, ideas uh, incorporated ideas of yin and yang and in a complex uh, cosmological system. One way of illustrating that are these two chapters about seeking rain and stopping rain. And he had very specific ideas about how you could get uh, the heavens to respond uh, to uh, different manifestations of yin and yang in the local environment to trigger either the beginning or the ending of, of rain. Another part of this sort of yin yang and wuxing uh, system, the next one, uh, is uh, uh, noted in, in these uh, chapters, uh, which uh, give uh, examples of uh, the five phases, the wuxing, and the emphasis here is the role of filial piety in uh, this process of the production uh, cycles. That things went in a, in a definite order. Uh, there was, for example, an order of production where wood uh, gave birth to fire, which gave birth to earth, in turn metal, and then uh, water. So that each part of these phases serves as father to the next phase, and the son phase sort of completes uh, what the father uh, has begun. Um, and Tong Zhong Shu argued that uh, this system incorporated these virtues of filial piety. For instance, in this quote, he says, wind and rain are generated by earth, but earth does not dare claim merit for such accomplishment. Rather, it confers such merit on heaven. Skipping on down, uh, the righteousness of the royal minister and the actions of the filial son are derived from earth. So again, these virtues are part of the whole cosmic uh, 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 process. And uh, here in uh, this uh, next uh, short uh, uh, quote, we have even more explicitly made the association with being filial and being loyal. Earth managing the affairs of fire fully expresses its loyalty. Thus, the five phases exemplify the conduct of the filial son and the royal minister. So here, uh, Tong Zhongshu is making an even stronger case of the uh, interdependence of filial piety and loyalty. Sort of in short, uh, the cosmological order of the five phases uh, Father linked the son to father uh, filial ties to the hierarchical and political relationship between officials and the emperor. Um, and although the uh, emperor is uh, championed and filial piety is uh, championed, uh, uh, you have uh, filial piety sort of serving to strengthen uh, the loyalty uh, to the uh, emperor. Um, next one. Uh, and just very briefly, uh, a mention of some of the uh, uh, post-Han uh, literature uh, here from the 
Shi uh, Shuo Xin Yu, the story about uh, Wang Shang, uh, who uh, was sleeping one night. He needed to get up uh, and uh, 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 go uh, use the toilet. When he came back, he discovered that his bedding had been stabbed with a knife. Uh, he realized that his stepmother was probably had probably intended to kill him. Uh, so he went to his stepmother and begged her to uh, kill him in his life. And uh, these uh, sort of stories uh, suggest that it's probably in this uh, period of disunity, uh, the Nanbei Chao uh, uh, period, uh, that the authority of the father is strengthened to an unprecedented uh, level so that one owes absolute obedience uh, to parents uh, regardless of the uh, circumstances so that the parent can never be wrong even as in this case if uh, the parent or step parent is uh, trying to kill you um, so now we'll sort of move back to the uh, Sanguayeni in late imperial uh, China. Um, because I think the, uh, the Sanguayeni puts a lot of this in really uh, sharp uh, focus. And uh, takes it, I think, to a, a logical uh, conclusion. And uh, here, going back to our story of uh, Shan Fu and Mother Xu, his, his mother, uh, here uh, uh, he has uh, gotten this uh, summons uh, from his mother his mother has been uh, captured by Cao Cao's forces, uh, brought to the capital, essentially uh, put under house arrest. Uh, she tries to provoke Cao Cao into killing her. Um, he almost obliges her, uh, but his advisors uh, explain to him what the mother is, is doing. So uh, he simply uh, uh, puts her under a house arrest. And one of his advisors pretends that he's her son's friend, so sends her a lot of uh, things that she would need. Uh, she sends back to the friend uh, thank you notes, uh, which uh, uh, he uses uh, to forge a letter. Uh, and this is part of the letter that she uh, supposedly has written, uh, this forged letter, uh, to her son. And the uh, uh, crucial part of the letter uh, here, she's sort of explaining her situation, how she's been, uh, you know, captured uh, by Cao Cao and uh, and Cao Cao has denounced uh, his uh, the son's betrayal and uh, put her in chains uh, supposedly um, and urges him to surrender and then uh, the clincher uh, here is come with all speed to fulfill your duty as a uh, as a filial son, arguing that you know if he uh, comes and surrenders, then uh, she will escape uh, with her life, and uh, uh, ending it by saying that the son is her sole hope of, of freedom, and therefore. Uh, there's no need for her to say 
uh, anymore. After receiving this letter, uh, then uh, Shan Fu here uh, is, of course, greatly distressed. And he goes uh, to see uh, Liu Bei sort of explaining uh, to him that uh, although he wants you know, to serve Liu Bei, but his mind is no longer able to concentrate on making strategy because he's so concerned about his mother and that his mother has summoned him, uh, therefore he cannot fail to respond and save his mother. Uh, Liu Bei's uh, advisors uh, uh, urge him uh, to uh, hold on to Shan Fu long enough for Cao Cao to lose patience and execute the mother so that uh, the son will then be even more uh, loyal, even more dedicated to taking revenge against uh, Cao Cao. Um, but uh, Liu Bei rejects all of that, right? Saying that the mother and son uh, relationship is the closest relationship and that uh, he's allowing uh, Shan Fu uh, to, to leave, and, res and in response uh, to uh, these uh, pleas to hold on to Shan Fu, he says essentially he had rather die first uh, than to do something that was inhumane and unjust. So uh, with uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, Shan Fu makes a, uh, a pledge to Liu Bei that he will not provide any uh, strategies uh, for uh, Cao Cao. So at this point, it appears that the novel is approving of Liu Bei's high regard for filial piety. Not only will this advisor not help Cao Cao, but in addition, uh, Shan Fu uh, introduces uh, Zhuge Liang as a superior strategist. Um, and on his way to save his mother, he takes a detour uh, to see uh, Zhuge Liang and to urge Zhuge Liang uh, to accept uh, the invitation that uh, would be coming from Liu Bei in order to save uh, the Han Dynasty. So uh, it appears that uh, the, uh, the novel is very much on Liu Bei's uh, side. <coughs> uh, when Shan Fu gets to the capital, uh, Cao Cao has arranged his advisors to be waiting on the city wall and to bring Shan Fu in to the court as soon as he arrives. Uh, Cao Cao first uh, uh, questions him about why he's serving uh, Liu Bei, etc. Uh, uh, and uh, he uh, Shan Fu responds in a kind of equivocal way. He tries to turn and successfully turns the discussion uh, to his mother and expresses his gratitude uh, for Cao Cao in uh, the fact that she's uh, still alive. Um, uh, <clears throat> oh, here. Uh, but here in this uh, passage, you have uh, Cao Cao expressing the anticipated uh, advice that he's expecting to get uh, from Shan Fu. So he allows Shan Fu to go see his mother, uh, but he's obviously expecting 
now he's going to get uh, some of this guy's advice. Um, Shampu goes to see his mother and he falls down, he uh, kowtows to his mother. His mother uh, pitches a fit and uh, this is what she says, much to his surprise. You disgraceful son, littering hither and thither for so many years. I thought you were finally making progress with your studies. Now you've ended up worse than you started. As a scholar, you should be aware that loyalty and filial piety may conflict. How could you have failed to see that Salsal uh, was a traitor who has abused and ruined his sovereign while Liu Bei, Liu Shanda, is widely known for humanity and, right, and righteousness. Moreover, he is a descendant of the royal house. You had found your proper master, but trusting a forged piece of paper, which you did not even bother to verify, you left the light for the dark and earned yourself a name beneath contempt Oh, you utter fool, um, with what kind of self-respect am I supposed to welcome you now that you have shamed the spirit of your ancestors and uselessly wasted your own life? So uh, here uh, the mother uh, berates him uh, so harshly uh, that he cows on the floor and she runs into the inner chamber, the, the bedroom. And the next thing Shan Fu knows, the servant screams that the mother has, uh, has hanged herself. He rushes in to try to save her. It's too late. She's dead. Uh, Cao Cao uh, uh, sends his condolences, he sends uh, gifts, uh, but Shan Fu uh, declines uh, all of them. Um, and it seems at this point in the, in the novel that Mother Xu's death and suicide was a total waste. Why did she do this? Her son had already promised not to help Cao Cao. And uh, so we uh, proceed next uh, to uh, get an idea of uh, the novel's view of, of this. And it comes in two forms. The first uh, Taoist uh, recluse, uh, Sima Wei, who was Shan Fu's friend, he comes to visit uh, Shan Fu and discovers that Shan Fu is no longer with uh, Liu Bei. Um, and he makes the uh, statement uh, here in this passage, so Shan Fu uh, fell for the ruse, or he's been tricked. Mother Xu is known for her absolute integrity. Even if Cao Cao imprisoned her, she would never agree to call for her son. The letter has got to be a forgery. By not going, he could have saved her. By going, he dooms her. Um, and he says, Mother Xu lives according to the highest ethic and would be ashamed of her son. Uh, so, uh, first you get this uh, judgment from this uh, Taoist, and then it's uh, further reinforced by a poem uh, that I've uh, only uh, quoted a few lines here. Mother Xu's integrity will save her for eternity. She kept her honor free of stain, a credit to her family name. Uh, 
boiling oil or scalding water knife or axe could not deter her. Then, lest San Fu shame his forebearers, she joined the ranks of martyred uh, mothers. Uh, so the poem reinforces this idea that Shan Fu did not understand just how loyal his mother was and what a exemplar of integrity uh, that she was. So therefore, the mother had to commit suicide to teach this fool, her son, an object lesson that he would understand in no uncertain terms that he had brought shame upon the ancestors and therefore make it absolutely certain that he would not uh, help uh, Cao Cao. Um, so here uh, you, uh, you have one uh, good example of uh, this uh, uh, total sort of transformation of Confucian values in the Sanguayani. And I want to uh, briefly uh, give you a couple of other uh, e examples. One uh, e example uh, here is uh, <coughs> the uh, um, the story of uh, of uh, uh, Wang Yun and uh, his uh, sort of adopted daughter Diao uh, 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 Qian and the scheme that they come up with uh, to save uh, the Han uh, dynasty um, and uh, it starts with uh, uh, Dao Chan uh, sort of sighing as she uh, sees her Wang Yun, her adopted uh, father, uh, come in uh, from the, the office um, and uh, be in such despair. And uh, she tells him in this uh, uh, context, explaining why she was sighing, uh, that no sacrifice on my part could repay even one ten thousandth of what I owe you. And then she continues further down in the quote, if there is any way I can serve you, I would welcome death 10,000 times uh, before declining. And uh, in response to this, uh, uh, then uh, Wang Yun uh, proclaims in surprise, you know, uh, who could have known that you're the person uh, that can save uh, the Han uh, dynasty? And he takes uh, the adopted daughter into the uh, hall of the ancestors and he kowtows uh, to his daughter. His daughter is shocked, of course, and um, uh, then Wang Yun explains to her uh, this scheme that he has uh, to use a double snare uh, to trick both uh, uh, Lu Bu uh, and uh, Dong Zhuo into wanting uh, her uh, uh, bodily um, and uh, uh, sort of trick them into turning against one another. And she responds uh, uh, that uh, if she cannot fulfill the duty and the assignment that Wang Yun is giving her, may I die by 10,000 cuts. Uh, so very graphic uh, language that both uh, Wang Yun and uh, uh, Dao Chan are not only putting their own lives on the line, they're risking, as Wang Yun says, 
the whole Wong uh, clan, uh, because if the plot is discovered, uh, they'll be totally wiped out. So they're willing graphically to sacrifice even their whole clan uh, for loyalty uh, to the ruler. Um, uh, and uh, so the, you're probably familiar with the story. Uh, Wang Yun uh, first enter, uh, entertains uh, Lu Bu and, uh, and promises uh, Dao Chan to him as his wife. And then the next day invites uh, Dong Zhuo over for dinner, gets him a little drunk, uh, calls uh, Dao, Ch uh, Dao Chan uh, in and presents her as his singing girl. And she sings and dances and he's captivated. And uh, so Wang Yun says, if you like her, you can have her. So Dong Zhuo takes her, takes her home. Uh, Lu Bu is incensed. <laughs> He's angry. Uh, he challenges Wang Yun. Wang Yun cleverly says, "Well, your your father, you know." And Lu Bu has sort of put himself as adopted son of Dong Zhuo. Uh, your your father asked to take the bride uh, uh, home uh, with him in preparation for the wedding, so I couldn't, uh, you know, object. Um, and Dong Zhuo, uh, uh, Lu Bu is so angry, he wants to uh, kill uh, Dong Zhuo, uh, but he's afraid to commit because he's afraid that historians uh, will condemn him in history for being unfilial. And Wang Yun explains to him that being loyal to the Han uh, dynasty will ensure that historians praise him for his loyalty, and that's more important than filial piety. And besides, Dong Zhuo tried to kill him uh, <laughs> when Dong Zhuo found him uh, talking uh, sweetly to uh, Dao Chang. Uh, so, uh, Lu Bu uh, joins the plot uh, and kills uh, Dong Zhuo and saves uh, the Han Dynasty. Um, and this is uh, the passage where Wang Yun uh, convinces uh, Lu Bu uh, to join the, the plot. And lastly, I want to look at the issue of the Brotherhood. Uh, Liu Bei Zhang Fei, and Guan Yu. And I think there's a progression here. Uh, in the case of Wang Yun, uh, Dao Chan, et cetera, you get a, a, a kind of artificial adopted uh, family relationship. Um, but here with the brotherhood, you get a constructed relationship, uh, family relationship, and on the one hand, uh, in the novel, uh, the, uh, the relationship of the brotherhood is glorified, uh, but I think the novel is also trying to caution uh, about the uh, difficulties and the problems of the brotherhood. Here is Walsh Roberts sort of talking about uh, this, making the point that uh, uh, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei are very minor characters, briefly mentioned uh, in the Sang Guo Zhe, uh, but in the novel they emerge as uh, big characters, fully fictionalized uh, uh, characters. And his conclusion here uh, that Liu Bei's loyalty uh, to the oath the Peach Garden Oath, becomes a trial of his worth as a brother as well as a king. And the plot turns on his decision. And to me, that's close to the point that I'm trying to sort of make this conflict 
our tension between loyalty and filial piety. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, here are uh, some of the uh, examples of uh, the of, of Guan Yu's uh, actions and demonstrating uh, his commitment uh, to the uh, Brotherhood, but also his strong sense of honor and uh, his uh, vulnerability to his own sense of his own personal honor. Uh, he uh, gets, essentially has to surrender uh, to uh, Cao Cao's horses, uh, but he gets a concession that if and when he finds uh, that Liu Bei is alive, he'll be able to go. Uh, Cao Cao tries to keep him from leaving, uh, but he does service for Cao Cao in killing uh, one of the enemy uh, generals that no one else can kill. Um, and so he uses this as an excuse to leave uh, Cao Cao and go look for Liu Bei. And in leaving, he makes uh, this last uh, comment, and it's one that will haunt him uh, the rest of his, uh, his life. For whatever benefaction or whatever uh, gifts, I may yet retain, remain in your debt, kindly defer the accounting until someday in the future. And because of this relationship that Guan Yu has with Cao Cao, uh, Zhuge Liang is, uh, is uh, unwilling initially uh, to give uh, Guan Yu a role in the battle for Red Cliffs. Uh, uh, Guan Yu greatly objects, uh, and only after Guan Yu ex ex pledges to accept uh, martial law, in other words, the death penalty if he doesn't prove loyal uh, to Liu Bei, uh, does uh, Zhuge Liang give him the most crucial ultimate opportunity to capture uh, Cao Cao. Um, and uh, this is a famous uh, story of the ambush on the road to Huarong. And uh, uh, here, uh, uh, Cao Cao's advisors give him some advice about how to uh, deal with, uh, with, Guan, uh, with Guan Yu. Uh, sort of take advantage of his sense of honor. And uh, this is precisely uh, what uh, uh, Cao Cao uh, does. Uh, uh, here in these uh, uh, quotes, uh, they have, uh, these are some of the passages in their dialogue as Cao Cao convinces uh, Guan Yu to let him escape. At first, uh, uh, Guan Yu remains focused on his instructions from uh, Zhuge Liang uh, to put the public interest above his personal sense of honor and personal interest. But gradually, Cao Cao sort of gets him to focus on uh, this uh, sense of trust and sense of, of uh, sort of personal integrity and honor. Uh, so as the conclusion uh, here, uh, the last uh, uh, quotation, and Guan Yu, whose sense of honor was as solid as a mountain, could not put Cao Cao's many obliging kindnesses or the thought of the slain commanders from his mind. Therefore, Guan Yu lets uh, Cao Cao uh, pass. Uh, Guan Yu uh, goes uh, back uh, to face uh, punishment, uh, but Liu Bei 
intervenes uh, and doesn't let Zhigueliang execute uh, Guan Yu uh, with this uh, famous passage uh, drawing attention uh, to the uh, oath at the uh, Peach uh, Garden uh, to live and die uh, together. And having uh, essentially Guan Yu promise uh, to redeem himself in the future, uh, but uh, Guan Yu doesn't redeem himself uh, when he's given uh, a, a, a task uh, uh, to uh, open up an eastern flank against uh, 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 Cao Cao uh, and the state of, of Wu uh, in the south sort of test uh, the alliance with Liu Bei uh, by offering to have a marriage alliance with Guan Yu. Uh, uh, Guan Yu, of course, uh, insults uh, the state of Wu. So he winds up uh, being ambushed and uh, killed. Then uh, to revenge or take revenge for Guan Yu's uh, death, uh, Liu Bei uh, wants to uh, mount this invasion of the state of Wu. And uh, some of uh, Guan Yu, some of Liu Bei's uh, advisors, including uh, one of the tiger generals, uh, Zhao Yun, uh, plead with him, uh, as in this uh, passage here, that it is uh, Cao Cao uh, who is the traitor and not Sun Quan in the Southland. Therefore, uh, Liu, Bei, uh, Liu Bei should focus on the north and liberating the north and not attacking the south because if you attack the south, then you're going to leave yourself vulnerable uh, to uh, attack and de defeat. Thanks. Um, and Liu Bei uh, responds to this uh, that Sun Quan is the one responsible for murdering uh, Guan Yu and these other people have joined in this uh, dastardly deed. So he says, until I've gnawed uh, their flesh and exterminated their clans, my humiliation will not be effaced, right? So a total emotional response without uh, any expressed concern for the ostensible purpose of the brotherhood uh, to protect uh, the Han uh, uh, Emperor and ensure the continuity of the Han uh, Dynasty. Um, so here in uh, conclusion, uh, we can see that the relationship between filial piety and loyalty and the shifting priorities between these two uh, values uh, changed over time. And gradually, over time, uh, the emphasis on loyalty to the ruler uh, took a greater and greater role until the Saguayani, when the loyalty to the ruler is the absolute value that trumps uh, family values. So much so that unless one is more loyal to the ruler and to the state uh, than uh, he or she is uh, to uh, the family, one is simply insulting and betraying uh, the ancestors uh, because you're contaminating uh, the family uh, reputation. And in the Sanguayani, uh, this is demonstrated, you know, first with an actual uh, mother-son relationship, and then with a 
an adopted family relationship uh, with the case of Wang Yun and his adopted daughter, and then an increasingly artificial relationship like the one between uh, Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu uh, to uh, the Brotherhood itself. And although the Brotherhood is there in the novel for great entertainment, and obviously it's the center of action in the novel, it seems that from this particular lens, the novel is also trying to provide a warning that this type of brotherhood that places an emphasis on a sense of honor and a sort of a quasi-equality within the brotherhood, that this type of bonding or this type of organization is detrimental, first of all, uh, to family, real family relationships, uh, and also is easily subverted even when the purpose of the Brotherhood is to protect the legitimate Han dynasty, the Brotherhood winds up in destroying the Han dynasty's last hope for continuation. Uh, so here, in a sense, uh, the priorities have gone uh, from a very family-centered uh, set of values in, the, in ancient Confucianism uh, to a very uh, state-centered, uh, uh, ruler-centered set of values uh, by the time you get to the uh, Ming Dynasty. Um, so the purpose uh, here, uh, besides making that point, is to uh, sort of parallel the point in uh, the first lecture about the growth of uh, authoritarian government in traditional China. Well, I look forward to your uh, criticisms and uh, suggestions uh, ab about uh, this theme. Thank you. So um, I guess we got like a uh, half an hour uh, for Q and A session. Um, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, convenience, I think uh, for our guests, you could ask in all three languages. You could ask in English, in Cantonese, and in Mandarin, Putonghua. It's totally fine. And the guest, Professor Tillman's Putonghua is good enough to answer your questions, so please. Please, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Tillman, uh, for your very interesting and invaluable lectures. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, such kind of ultimate transcendental values, such as uh, filial piety and loyalty, uh, such ultimate transcendental values, they are attached to some kind of objects. For example, as I've heard from your, your lecture, that uh, in the warrior states, in the, in the time of Confucius, uh, the transcendentals, uh, where use of filial piety attached to the, to the ancestors. And then as for the loyalty, they attach to the, to the emperor. At, at, at that stage, that's the, the stage of the Confucius, they, they are more or less interchangeable, interchangeable. Uh, in what sense? There's the, the, and the role of ancestor and the role of emperor are interchangeable. So that such kind of ultimate transcendental values such as uh, filial piety and loyalty. They, they are, there's, there's no a, a marked demarcations or we cannot judge at that point of time there's the warrior states that uh, any, uh, any one of them are overriding the other. But by and by till the Ming dynasties, as you have uh, uh, concluded your remarks, 
by and by the, the transcendental values of loyalty have overtaken or, or have achieved the, the supremacy over the transcendental or filial piety. So that by, time, by the time when we reach the Ming Dynasty, uh, the, uh, the, the loyalty of our Chi the, the Chinese are much more greater or taken the supremacy over the values to the family. So uh, may I ask, what, is, what, are, what do you think that, uh, such are the main factors which cause such kind of uh, transformation over thousands of years? Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you. Um, uh, my perception of the first part is slightly uh, different, uh, so let me try to clarify that uh, first, if I may. I think for Confucius and Mencius, uh, uh, loyalty and filial piety aren't on the same level, that they're putting a priority of importance on uh, filial values. Um, and they see filial values and family values as the long-term uh, foundation for society and for the state. Um, uh, so the, uh, the, the change is even more uh, stark. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when you get to uh, the Chun Chou Fan Lu, um, and the and the Shaojing, then you get uh, a little bit more uh, e equivalence, especially uh, in the Chunchou Fan Lu uh, uh, interaction between and sort of pairing of filial piety and, and loyalty. Um, so I think it's a sort of a three stage kind of progression. Um, uh, but the uh, question of, of why is, uh, is a difficult one. But I think uh, my sense is that a big factor is, you know, what I talked about uh, on, on campus uh, on, on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, I guess it was. Tuesday. On Tuesday, the sort of growing power of the ruler in China uh, during this uh, period. So that, uh, you know, especially in the day of Confucius and Mencius, although there was the Zhou King, in reality, the Zhou King had very little power. Uh, so in a way, in that environment, uh, although both of them supported the idea of ruled by the Zhou King, and they wanted unification under the Zhou King, but it really wasn't all that much of an option. Uh, and the bigger problem was ending the Civil War, restoring uh, order, restoring unity, and as individual intellectuals, essentially they were trying to do it from the bottom up, or at least uh, from a starting from a group of intellectuals to try to radically change society through sort of family values and and ritual. Uh, but over time, as the power of the uh, emperor uh, grew increasingly strong, uh, then you have people like uh, Dong Zhongshu and the Han essentially uh, further strengthening the position of the ruler, making the ruler uh, a cosmological uh, force and part of the larger natural order. Um, so this greatly enhances the ruler's power at a time that Hamudi is using monopolies, etc., to increase his power as well. Uh, so, you know, the, the whole situation is radically changing. And in the early Ming, uh, you know, Zhu Yanzhang is going to unprecedented 
levels of, of uh, sort of despotic rule to enforce his vision of what China should be. And I think part of the answer is that that type of larger government environment and sort of reality of these different periods is inclining or in influencing the intellectuals uh, to see things in, in particular ways. It's sort of the, in a way, again, the crisis that they perceive uh, of their own, own day. Uh, so t to me, these two, two lectures are sort of two sides of the same basic coin. They're sort of interrelated. Um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that it's reducible to that. You know, there are other things going on. But I think uh, that that must be a, a central thread to, uh, to what's going on. Other questions? Any other questions in English? Hey, there is a question now. Um, I want to ask you, because there are other students who say that the most important thing is 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 that to fulfill um, uh, the filial piety, a sense of filial piety to your parents, is equivalent to fulfill your responsibility to the emperor in ancient China, right? Uh, is it uh, ancient China, right? Is it ancient China, right? Is it ancient China, right? Is it ancient So he asked, uh, in that case, is there a big difference between, or like you said, the conflicts between filial piety and loyalty? If to fulfill filial piety is uh, a manifestation of your responsibility to the emperor. Well, to 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 me, it, it's a uh, sort of a way of of reconciling or resolving uh, the tension, and especially uh, uh, in in a way, it's it's saying there's no real tension, right? But at the same time, it's also, to me, revealing that there's still some tension, right? Because you're sort of opting for which you consider to be the priority, right? If I, uh, you know, stay home, look after my aged uh, uh, parent, uh, that is adequate to, you know, or takes the place of answering the emperor's summons to go to the capital and, and be a bureaucrat and serve uh, the, the emperor. So, you know, if I, so I could use that uh, uh, quotation and, and, you know, it, it does, you know, come up. But to me, the people that are making that statement are sort of, in a way, very much expressing a priority. Um, and often, in some of those cases, making an excuse for not going to serve uh, the government, right? So it's, a, it's still a, a choice of prioritizing, of, you know, which is more important and making a sense, essentially a political assertion, right, that uh, serving the parents is, is more important and can get you out of, uh, of going and serving in, in the government, uh, especially if you uh, happen to disagree with, uh, you know, with the government. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, intellectuals over the centuries have used excuses like this, um, our poor health, et cetera, uh, simply to Avoid the dangers of uh, serving in, in government. Okay. 
Any questions? I think we still get plenty of time, right? Uh, this sir made a comment. He said, in Chinese, there is an old saying like, uh, for all the good bad uh, virtuous video party uh, is the first, the best. So, mm -hmm. so he's making a comment that what, how do you connect your you know, conflict between video party and loyalty with the you know, traditional or popular conception, Chinese conception of taking video party as the first priority. Yeah, and you see that reflected in the Xiaojing, right? And, uh, you know, very much so. Um, so, you know, uh, as in some of the, you know, passages, uh, you know, put on the, the screen uh, from the Xiaojing, this sort of assumption that the, the, the first virtue, the sort of uh, root or source of, all virtues is really uh, filial piety because you learn you you're born into a, a, a family uh, have parents and it's through your interaction with those parents that you learn how to love and how to respect and you learn also how to extend those feelings and behavior to other people to your siblings and to your neighbors, et cetera. So it, it's sort of the where you learn all the other uh, virtues, right? So you, you, there's a number of, uh, of people over the centuries have, that have championed uh, filial piety is really the cornerstone of the whole Confucian virtue uh, scheme of things, right? Um, but there are alternatives, right? Like, uh, for instance, Mengzi, you know, it's run E, right? Humaneness, benevolence, and uh, doing what's right. You know, that from, you know, those who focus on a more philosophical uh, basis for Confucian and Chinese values, you know, they would look to, you know, run E instead of uh, Xiao. Um, and, you know, this is true of Minchus, it's also true of, of, of Zhu Xi. Uh, Zhu Xi, interestingly, uh, although, you know, his view on the four books, you know, became the center of orthodoxy, but Zhu Xi's view of the, of the Xiao Jing uh, was largely ignored. Uh, uh, Zhu Xi uh, had faith only in the uh, the Gu Wan uh, version of the Xiao Jing and he also argued that most of the Xiao Jing was a much later addition commentary to the text that had been sort of blurred into the text etc. Uh, so with his sort of philosophical orientation, uh, Jishi clearly, w uh, his conception of Confucian values and virtues were in, you know, humaneness, run in E, that sort of thing, and, and not in, in Xiao. Um, but, you know, some of his contemporaries like Lu Chan is very f uh, famous uh, for putting uh, Xiao as uh, the sort of cornerstone of, of Confucian values. So even intellectuals, you know, uh, had, you know, very different approaches to that. And it largely reflects sort of how you, what you perceive Confucianism to be a, all about, right? And if you look at uh, Confucianism as primarily a you know, family-centered uh, value system, uh, that is focused on ritual behavior and ritual using ritual to socialize and make people into better individuals uh, then you know you're more likely to regard uh, Shao as the real 
cornerstone of everything. Um, but, you know, to me, the Confucian tradition is quite diverse and complex, and different uh, people have, uh, have really, re you know, seen it quite differently. Mr. Tillman, thanks so much for the inspiring lectures. We give a full account of the conflict between two very uh, fundamental values in Chinese uh, uh, cultural histories. But uh, when Chinese society uh, get more modernized and westernized, well, nowadays, in your opinion, is, there, is, is this still such a conflict in the Chinese culture nowadays in Chinese society? Um, because I, I raise this question because after the cultural revolutions, when uh, and under the one-party rule, okay, um, maybe the Chinese society emphasized more about the um, loyalty to the government and also to the authority instead of the, the, the other uh, social value. So um, how you think about um, Chinese society nowadays on these two conflicting values? Oh, okay, um, but let me first uh, s sort of, for my own curiosity, sort of, if you were, uh, would uh, raise your hand first if you regard filial piety is is more a higher priority than uh, loyalty. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. What about those that consider uh, loyalty more important than filial piety, if you could raise your hand. Uh, very interesting, sort of fairly close. Uh, uh, but but, mo but it, to me, most interesting is that most of you didn't raise your hand. Um, and and, and I, maybe it's because you didn't want to commit yourself. But um, my impression is uh, is very much like yours that you know the the sanguini has had in in that kind of view has had more impact uh, in today's society than people reading uh, the Lunyu and the Mangzi, <laughs> uh, quite frankly, and uh, I do have uh, sort of a project for exploring uh, this in a more uh, scholarly, uh, social science-y sort of way, I've uh, joined a small group of my colleagues, principally uh, a boy, uh, Stephen Bokenkamp, who's a specialist on uh, Taoism, and uh, Chun Huayu, uh, who's uh, another of my colleagues whose specialty is uh, Chinese Buddhism. And the three of us are exploring the revival of traditional values in China today. And we came up with a, a survey um, that so far we've passed out only in the city of Xiamen. Um, and uh, have about uh, 260 people uh, that fill the survey out. And we tried to uh, provide a survey that really reflects uh, Chinese uh, society. We got a lot of advice from uh, scholars uh, in, in China because most of the surveys that people hand out about religion our belief in China is very much from a very modern Western point of view. Uh, you know, the question is, you know, what do you believe in? <laughs> uh, but that's not really a very suitable question for getting at, you know, uh, what really uh, drives people in uh, a Chinese society. 
a question more appropriate is sort of what kind of rituals uh, do you perform? Uh, for example. So anyway, I was able to put in two questions, uh, more than two, but two questions directly related uh, to this talk. And initially I was going to, you know, get through all of those surveys and boil it all down and analyze it and report on it. Uh, but I got too busy with other things. But basically uh, my impression so far in reading these and the questions were, uh, uh, first of all, in terms of the Lunyu passage, you know, if the father steals the sheep, I, I said, you know, if your relative steals someone's property, you know, I tried to sort of modernize it a little bit, right? Uh, you know, uh, would you uh, report your father to the Gunganju, uh, or would you try to protect your, your father from the authorities? Um, and the other uh, question re uh, referring specifically to the case of uh, Mother Xu and her son, Shanfu, um, and her statement about, you know, filial piety and loyalty uh, may conflict and you have to get your priorities straight. I asked them, you know, which is more important? And it was striking to me, um, first of all, how many people were willing to sort of say that uh, duty to the family was most important. But uh, when they got to that first question about what they would do, you know, some of the, uh, some of the people who answered that filial uh, piety, duty to the family was most important, their response to, you know, Mother Shoes, uh, uh, you know, or response to, you know, reporting on their own uh, relative was, you know, you don't want to take things to such an extreme, right? And to me, that also indicated you know, as in the case of uh, Ju Xi, as in the case of the Xiaojing, the tendency to want to try to find some common ground within this tension, some unity, some reconciliation, right? You want to find some way to be uh, consistent to both things that you consider to be good. Right? Um, and so this is, I think, uh, probably uh, w maybe one reason that a lot of you didn't raise your hand either way, right? Because you want to wait and look into the circumstances. Try to find a way to make these th two things work, right? This is, you know, reconciling this uh, tension is very much the focus in Chinese culture. But the effort to reconcile them, right, sort of shows that there's some, you know, tension there. Uh, the tension isn't usually so strong to be a big contradiction, but there's still difficulty in making the decision when faced with this type of circumstances. And the good thing about literature like the Sangho Yeni, you know, it's fiction, so, or largely fiction, 70% uh, according to Lu Xun. But uh, you can sort of make the situation much more stark, right? Much more radical choice. Uh, so you can see things much, much more clearly. I have a question. <laughs> Let me ask the question, Professor. 
Uh, I'm quite interested in you know, saying that um, somebody who didn't raise their hands is uh, like to depends on the circumstance. I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'm just wondering why I didn't raise my hand. Uh, my self-reflection is I didn't know, you know exactly based on your saying about the context, the circumstance. I didn't know what's the exact meaning when we are talking about loyalty, what we are talking about. Like you said in the presentation, if it's a loyalty toward a personnel, like a, a ruler, an emperor, or it's a kind of a personality toward an institution. Because in Hong Kong, we got a lot of loyalty toward our own company, right? On the Zhongcheng Dui Gong Si, right? But that kind of loyalty is quite different from the first kind of loyalty toward one person. And there are a third kind of loyalty is uh, loyalty toward abstract uh, abstract uh, mind or a kind of uh, philosophical meanings like loyalty toward human rights, loyalty toward democracy, loyalty toward like um, despotism, probably somebody. So for all different kinds of loyalty, um, when you are doing the questionnaire or doing a survey, how do we you know, decide it? Or based on your um, historical knowledge, how the traditional Chinese to, to, to make a judgment between all these different kind of loyalties. Do they have like a fixed uh, loyalty, uh, very clear loyalty toward a person, an institution, or a state? Uh, very, very good question. And to, to me, it's, uh, you know, probably if I ask that question, you know, the initial question uh, to an American audience, uh, my guess would be that it would be easier for people to sort of make uh, a, a choice, right? And I think that's the reflection of the cultural difference. Um, uh, you know, Americans, as a generalization, comparatively, you know, these we're making big generalizations here, uh, but operate on these kinds of of a big picture big term uh, sort of con conceptions, especially in, uh, like you said, you know, democracy, human rights, uh, you know, freedom, et cetera, right? So uh, uh, Americans, uh, if you look at American sort of, you know, surveys of public opinion, often you're, they're asking for that type of you know, big generalization. Whereas, to me, it's precisely uh, the sort of penchant or the tendency within Chinese culture to want to look at not this abstraction mm -hmm. of loyalty, feeling of piety, whatever it is, but look at it in a particular context, right? Loyalty to whom, right? Is it, you know, your parent or is it your boss? <laughs> is it, you know, New Asia College? <laughs> uh, you know, what exactly is it? So, uh, you know, in, in setting up that kind of question to really try to be responsive to, you know, a Chinese environment, it does need to be sort of specified, you know, what kind of uh, situation. But of course, you know, probably a lot of people's perceptions of these terms, say, you know, shall, in different situations are vis-a-vis -vis different individuals are going to be quite different, right? Um, so, it would, you know, it's a huge challenge, right? Sort of how do you formulate it in such a way that you can get an answer that you can use in a social science sort of way for analysis that's still reflective of what people are actually uh, thinking. It, it's, it's, not, it's not easy at all, uh, it's especially for probing uh, you know, trying to, you know, get uh, uh, Chinese uh, 
uh, per perceptions of things. It's a, a huge uh, challenge. And this is probably one reason that, you know, sort of opinion surveys are not really very well uh, developed for, you know, studying contemporary uh, uh, China. It's uh, a, a bigger, a bigger sort of uh, obstacle than it is in, in the West. Not only because, you know, in China, people are less willing to uh, publicize their personal opinions, but, but also just the, the larger cultural environment and sort of uh, how questions are, are posed. And you sort of want, you know, like with, with Mitch's, right, to sort of tell a story, sort of provide a specific context. And in this specific context, right, like the story of, you know, do you reach out your hand to save your uh, drowning sister, right? So sort of uh, make a specific, you know, situation uh, that would make the choice then quite, quite clear. Um, so that is a, a huge uh, complication. So I think it's time if there are no more questions, I think it's time to, for us to thank you, Professor Tillman, again and uh, for his uh, fascinating speech. Thank you, Professor Tillman. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, thank you Professor Hoi Tillman and Professor Chen Hiu Yu. The lecture has come to an end, and we would like to thank you all once again for joining us this afternoon for the Yu Yingxin Lecture in History 2016 series. Goodbye, and may we wish you all a great weekend. Thank you.